education at relatively low cost. Um, I think the most amazing thing to me about the past six weeks is sort of the panic that ensued um, with just a few cases, and, and a large-scale event would obviously just be multiplied that many more times. And for biologic agents, um, because almost every, every infectious disease has an incubation period, the perpetrators can, one, protect themselves, because they know what they're working with, with either antibiotics or vaccine, and also the incubation period between when something's released and when people start getting ill allows them time to get far away. Um, there are hundreds, if not a thousand or so, different uh, bacteria, viruses, uh, or toxins that theoretically could be used as a weapon. Um, but most uh, government agencies, like the Centers for Disease Control or the military, when they think about what are the priority agents that we need to think about and prepare for, sort of prioritize based on some of these characteristics. Um, the first bullet is uh, unfortunately true for every uh, biologic agent, and has, uh, at least initially, I think less so now, but when we first started dealing with our partners in emergency management and uh, the fire police, other agencies that are more first responder agencies, I think the hardest thing for them to recognize is that there wouldn't be a scene for them to respond to. Um, unlike the Japanese subway attack a few years back, when something's released, if we weren't told about it, there's no way that we would know until people become ill, and that could be hours to days to weeks for some of the agents. So the ability to sort of respond to a scene with lights and sirens just isn't there. Um, some of these agents are theoretically inexpensive and relatively easy to produce. Again, the technologic challenge is aerosolizing them at the right size so that they can be breathed in all the way into the lung tissue. Larger size particles would be filtered out by the hairs in our nose or the hairs lining our um, uh, trachea and bronchi. Um, some agents, not many of them, will survive in the environment, and that's true for anthrax. Most of the ones on the list I'll show you um, cause either a lethal or a disabling disease, so they have that um, aspect to them to increase the terror as far as when an outbreak occurs. Um, fortunately, very few of them have an issue as far as secondary ways of infection with person-to-person -person transmission, but the biggest concern here uh, is smallpox. And for some of the agents, there's either no effective treatment or prophylaxis, or it's in short supply, um, and that's currently the case with the smallpox vaccine. Um, this is a list of uh, the potential agents with, uh, for bacteria, anthrax is usually at the top of the list, for viruses, smallpox, and for toxins, botulism. Um, and just for the sake of sort of uh, making a point about what the issues would be in responding to a large-scale event, I'm just going to quickly focus on anthrax and smallpox. Um, this is what the anthrax bacteria looks like. And I just want to make the point that this is not an uncommon disease in many parts of the world. We do, even in the United States, have sporadic cases. But worldwide, the most common form of the disease next slide, is the cutaneous form, um, which we did see here in New York City, um, which is, causes an ulcerative disease, uh, ulcer lesion that gets very black and necrotic in the center, um, but with treatment, patients do very well. So I'm going to go back up. Um, as far as the use of anthrax as a biologic weapon, I think why it's sort of always at the top of most people's list um, is that one, the issues about environmental decontamination, that the spores theoretically can remain viable for years. Um, so the issues as far as decontamination that that raises and that we recently dealt with with the events here. Um, the disease that we've always been worried about with anthrax wasn't cutaneous anthrax, which we first started seeing here that sort of took us by surprise that we would see cutaneous cases. We've been more thinking along the lines of preparing for inhalational. And the reasons for that is that it's a much more severe disease um, that, at least based on the literature, was almost always fatal, even with antibiotics. Uh, the good news about anthrax is that we're much better at treating it, it now than we realized, and patients actually, um, more patients survived than were expect, expected. And then we now know it's not just been weaponized by the U.S., former Soviet Union, and Iraq, um, by us, but also by whoever's um, responsible for the recent events. Um, as far as the disease inhalational mm -hmm. anthrax, the challenge from my perspective um, is detecting it, and the real issue is that for the first several days of illness, um, the symptoms are very nonspecific. They'll resemble the flu, and it's not going to be obvious to a clinician seeing a patient, especially this time of year as flu activity increases, until patients become uh, much sicker, which takes several days, and they develop very high fevers, um, problems breathing, and then this classic uh, uh, syndrome of uh, necrotizing hemorrhagic mediastinitis, which is basically all the tissues under your uh, sternum 
where chest bone um, sort of melting. It's just the, the disease is just dramatic once it gets into uh, the, um, uh, the tissues. And again, this is uh, sort of the historical slide. It was almost always fatal within a day um, once it got to this point despite antibiotic therapy. And I think this is still true. I think the difference is, is that some of the recent patients were treated early. Um, the diagnosis, again, is difficult. There's no specific physical finding when the doctor examines you, but there are some characteristic findings on chest x-ray um, that are important to educate physicians about. And then the laboratory um, should, should ideally be the first one to truly recognize what's going on, is that you will see a very characteristic stain, uh, staining pattern um, in any positive blood or other uh, sterile fluids. Um, and a couple of years ago, these large gram-positive rods um, would be thought to be a contaminant. Most of them were bacillus species that were usually just on the skin and contaminated a blood culture. So there needed to be a change, and I think in New York City, I would hope that no micro lab would throw out uh, any blood culture that was beginning to show that finding. Um, and obviously the need to call us so that we can confirm the diagnosis. This is just a chest x-ray that shows a widened uh, amount of tissue um, that is sort of the diagnostic clue that we're trying to um, educate physicians in New York City, especially radiologists, about. And sometimes the findings are, are um, subtle. Um, as far as medical management, um, naturally occurring anthrax is very susceptible to a long list of antibiotics. Um, but historically, or um, theoretically, based on uh, the uh, papers that have been put out on, on bioterrorism and anthrax, the concern was is that if a terrorist was smart enough to weaponize anthrax successfully, they might be uh, smart enough to make it antibiotic resistant. And the antibiotic that would be toughest to do that for is ciprofloxacin. So that's why that was initially sort of the drug of choice. Uh, the current anthrax strain is very susceptible to antibiotics, and we've tried to um, recommend not using Cipro um, uh, for prophylaxis because of the concerns about antibiotic resistance in the community for other uh, bacteria, not for anthrax. Um, and I think the only good news about anthrax is it doesn't spread person to person, that we don't know special precautions would be needed in the hospital. Um, the other issue with anthrax is that if you're exposed to an aerosol of spores, um, the only ability to make a difference is to start uh, antibiotic prophylaxis as soon as possible after that exposure, um, the choice uh, depending on what, what it's susceptible to. And unfortunately, it requires a lot of antibiotics. The uh, recommendation is for 60 days if there's no vaccine available, which there's not, um, 30 days if a uh, vaccine is available. Um, so um, obviously the logistics, it was relatively easy to do that for the couple thousand of people that were put on it uh, here in New York City, most of them related to the Postal Service. Um, but to do that for a large, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, logistically would obviously be difficult. Um, the vaccine, the bottom line is that it's not available uh, in large quantities, um, and right now is owned by the military, so this is not an option today. Um, switching to smallpox, this is what smallpox looks like um, under the electron microscope. Um, and as far as why smallpox is of concern as a potential weapon, uh, some of the reasons are listed here, and probably the biggest is that it's, um, actually that's several bullets down, but it, it is infectious via aerosol. Most of us um, would be susceptible, even those of us who've been vaccinated, because no one here in this country has been vaccinated except for the military uh, since the early 1970s, and those, some, those of us who receive vaccine might be less susceptible. I mean, we wouldn't, the public health authorities would never take the, um, would never assume that and everyone would need vaccine. Um, the morbidity and mortality I'll talk about in a second. It is transmissible person to person, so the concern is, is that 10, 100 people um, being infected with smallpox would multiply very quickly if not, uh, if, if vaccine, a vaccination campaign wasn't uh, successful. Um, the challenge with smallpox is very similar to anthrax. Many of our initial skin infections with anthrax were misdiagnosed here in the city because no physicians had seen it. The common misdiagnosis was a, um, a spider bite, a brown necklace spider bite. Well, the same might be true for smallpox, um, given there are very few physicians in the U.S., not just New York City, who have ever seen a case. And then there, one, we don't have much vaccine available today, and there's concerns about its potency, and I'll get back to that in a second. Well, smallpox is not a disease that theoretically should be on the list. It doesn't exist anymore. It was officially, a, a last case was in 1977, and it was officially declared uh, eradicated uh, two, uh, two years later. Um, we stopped vaccinating in this country, country in 1972, and worldwide, um, no one's really been vaccinated in 15 or 20, or over 20 years now. So worldwide immunity has waned. 
Um, the, the concern is, is that, as you, I'm sure you've read in the paper, there are two stockpiles of this virus. It's been very controversial whether they should be destroyed or not. Um, one is at the CDC, and I used to work with the CDC, and I've seen the building that it's in. And um, uh, Not that security at CDC was great until recently, but this particular building uh, was very secure. No one could get in it without several levels of, of uh, identification, and the place where it was kept was well locked up. So a very secure supply here in the United States. The other stockpile um, was left in uh, the former Soviet Union, um, and the concern is, is that, that we now know that not only was, were they not just uh, guarding it, but they were actively work, working on weaponizing smallpox. And the scariest uh, point in Ken Alabeck's book is not only were they working on it, but they got very close to successfully weaponizing it, meaning that they had come up with a formulation that would have survived a release and been of the right particle size to infect people. And the concern is, one, the scientists uh, that worked with him, not all of them can be accounted for. And then the issue of what they took with them when they left is really why smallpox remains on the list. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about the clinical features, but um, the incubation period is one of the longest ones of uh, all the bioterrorist agents. It can be almost two weeks after you're exposed before you become ill. Similar to anthrax, the first symptoms are nonspecific, would look like any uh, viral type illness. And it's really not until the rash appears that, that uh, an astute physician might recognize uh, smallpox. And luckily, you're not thought to be infective until that rash appears. Um, this is just uh, several slides to show the progression of smallpox. And this is several days into the rash in a young child who was not vaccinated. And maybe uh, back uh, in the 70s, an astute physician uh, where smallpox was endemic would say this is smallpox to prove it otherwise. But here in the United States, there's many childhood rashes that might look like that. But as uh, days progress and it gets more severe, um, obviously at some point, I'm hoping that an astute physician will be concerned and call us. There are some things that help differentiate it from uh, the other diseases that it might be confused with, such as chickenpox. But the initial, the to know for sure will require getting specimens to the one lab in the country that can um, uh, diagnose it, which is at CDC. The technology really is limited to CDC, and it has to be uh, performed in their highest level safety lab, the BSL-4 lab. Um, there are some features about the rash, especially, that differentiate it from uh, varicella's chickenpox, variola is smallpox, that help differentiate it, and it's getting these uh, clues out to physicians is what we're trying to uh, do now that um, anthrax, most physicians in New York City, I think, have heard enough about anthrax and feel like they understand that the new demand for information is smallpox. So we're taking advantage of that and trying to get the word out. Um, there's no question that even one suspect case, and we've had several false alarms here in the city. We go out for every one. Um, only one is required sending specimens down to CDC. Um, it was pretty obvious quickly that it wasn't smallpox just clinically. But even one truly suspect case would be an international emergency given the reintroduction of smallpox into the human population. The patient would need to be quarantined with uh, very good isolation. And unfortunately, there really isn't much to offer with therapy. It would be supportive care. There are some antiviral medications that look to be effective in the laboratory. Um, but sedidivir, which is the one that has been mostly most studied, there's not much of it. It has to be given intravenously, and it's got some severe toxicities. So the reality is, is it would primarily be supportive care. Um, our role at the health department would really be uh, vaccination to prevent ongoing disease. Again, there's not much we could do for the individual patients who are already sick. Um, the current vaccine is another uh, virus called vaccinia that's very closely related. Um, it was actually developed here by the um, uh, city health department years back, so it's named after us. Um, and this vaccine uh, has not been sort of refurbished since the 1970s, so it's 30 years, over 30 years old. There's been some concerns about its viability, though with recent uh, testing of it, it does seem to be okay. The real issue is, is that there's not much of it. Um, an estimated 7 to 15 million doses currently. So there are two things going on. One is, as you know, the government has decided to um, basically have a stockpile to cover the entire U.S. population. And until we get there, there's some preliminary studies that show that we could probably dilute this vaccine um, in order to increase the supply.